Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to another Adipuli episode from Didi Cuba. And today we have with us your two main hosts, Dr. Arun Nair, uh, pediatrician in the US, resident pediatrician in the US, and I'm Keith Matthew, a foundation year training doctor here in the UK, in the Northeast. How are you guys doing? Macha, say hi to all our dearest viewers. Namaskar. Namaskar. And without much without much delay, let's go on to our topic. What is our topic today, Dr. Arun Nair? Our topic today is sweeping the world, and it's not COVID. It's actually bronchiolitis. bronchiolitis. Yes, that is our topic for today. And bronchiolitis is, uh, <clears throat> in which population do we see bronchiolitis, Macha? Does everybody get bronchiolitis, or is it a certain population, or a certain group of patients, per se? You see it <clears throat> in kiddos. Little kids, Absolutely. typically Absolutely. under the age of two, most commonly. But yeah. however, rates have been changing. As you see in clinical practice, you see kids who are three, four, sometimes even five years old who are getting bronchiolitis and having to be admitted as well. So trends are changing, but most commonly un under the age of two. Also, um, usually very, very small neonates or, I mean, neonates or like very small infants don't usually get it. But like you said, the, the boundaries are getting bigger. Yeah. yeah, what is bronchiolitis, Dr. Arunaya? So, let's break down the word. Bronchioles and itis. Bronchioles are the smaller airways within your lungs. Obviously, you have your trachea, your bronchi, then your bronchioles. Right? So, and itis means inflammation. So, simply put, it's inflammation of the smaller airways within your lungs. Now, what causes bronchiolitis? There's a whole list of stuff. Most commonly, it's viral. And the most commonly associated virus with bronchiolitis is the respiratory syncytial virus. However, you will see a lot of different viruses that pop up, including rhinovirus, which is very, very common. And it's currently actually sweeping the U.S., actually, with its new variant, the D68 variant. It's actually sweeping and actually causing more severe symptoms in kids who are needing more pediatric intensive care unit admissions. So that's actually a, something that we've been seeing, but also other viruses can include the human metanumovirus. It can include adenovirus. And sometimes you can have two viruses coexisting or even more than two. And rarely it can be caused by bacteria, including Staph aureus. As well. Okay. <clears throat> that's, that's absolutely right. Um, I'm not sure about the variants, but... Um... <clears throat> it, it's also looking very much prevalent now here in the UK, given we're approaching the winter season, which is the season usually where, <clears throat> uh, uh, you know, it's called the bronchiolitis season, and we are always priming our uh, A&Es and emergency care and wards and things. And there's a lot of education around this topic during the time of the year, which is why we thought we would talk about this today. Uh, bronchiolitis. So <clears throat> you've talked about what is bronchiolitis and the cause of bronchiolitis. Uh, what is the pathophysiology or why is, um, so, okay, so basically bronchiolitis is a low respiratory tract infection, mm -hmm. correct? Uh, yeah. How is bronchiolitis different, like, let's say, asthma? Right, so the actual mechanism of action from these different viruses is different, and yet there, is similar, there are similarities to asthma. So with the respiratory syncytial virus, the way it causes bronchiolitis is by causing epithelial cell necrosis. And I will break this down in terms of, I will explain it in much simpler terms. So with the respiratory syncytial virus, what it does is basically it gets inside the cell, it kills the cell, and the cell eventually dies, which is called necrosis, right? And when that happens, essentially, it being necrosis, you have an inflammatory reaction around it that causes increased production of fluid or edema that builds up and narrows the airway, and that results in a very bad cough, right? And mucus plugs, it makes it difficult to breathe. You have a cough. And because of the general inflammatory nature of the virus, you get a fever, which are the classic symptoms in bronchiolitis, right? Obviously, with viruses, you have to look out for upper respiratory tract infections as well, like our upper upper respiratory tract symptoms, runny noses, sometimes red eyes with certain viruses, a sore throat can happen as well. So these are some things you'll have to look out for to determine usually like, you know, a viral 
prodrome can happen as well in a lot of cases. But interestingly, with rhinovirus, it's a completely different mechanism of action. It's not necessarily cell necrosis. It's more so the interference with interferon. Right. So the reason why I said there are similarities to asthma is because asthma is also having a role, like interferons have a role in the pathogenesis of asthma. Now, when we start going into these two topics, it goes into a whole other lecture. But the point, the most simplest thing is the fact that both have degrees of inflammation in them. But bronchiolitis is most commonly caused by viruses. Whereas asthma is most commonly IgE mediated. And what do I mean by IgE? It's an immunoglobulin. There are five types of immunoglobulins that we have in our body. All right. One of them being IgE, which is commonly seen in allergic reactions. And in asthma, what happens is the fact that essentially due to this IgE buildup, you essentially have mucus plugging, you have edema, you have basically difficulty breathing and cough. But the absent thing is the fact that very rarely would you have a fever compared to bronchiolitis. So it can be hard to distinguish. So sometimes a chest x-ray can help, a respiratory viral panel can help distinguish between both. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, that's, uh, I actually didn't know that, the last bit. So which, which, which are the perks of having a pediatrician on board, you know, and talking about a pediatric topic. So uh, yeah, so that was good. Um, <clears throat> another thing I'd like to talk about is uh, how bronchiolitis so let's say just talking about differential diagnosis for bronchiolitis um, at least here in the UK it could be a viral induced squeeze so um, <clears throat> bronchiolitis as far as I understand could present like you said because of the pathophysiology uh, when you listen to their chest you could hear crackles and they would present with a cough which is a bronchiolitic sort of cough and they would have wheeze as well but in a viral induced wheeze, it tends to be more so uh, wheeze that would, I would say, improve with beta agonists like salbutamol because, like you mentioned, the pathophysiology is different in bronchiolitis. Mm -hmm. uh, Interestingly the... enough, though, sometimes we do give albuterol. We... It's albuterol. not recommended. The American Academy of Pediatrics don't recommend the use of albuterol. Per se, it's not a strong recommendation, but a lot of centers around the world still do give it for symptomatic relief, mm. as in it helps kids. It's a bronchodilator, as in it increases the diameter of the bronchiole, allowing sort of more expulsion of any mucus or any edema yeah. or any sort of phlegm that's there and opens it up so that the patient can breathe a little bit better. But it's not a recommended intervention. So in, so in the UK, um, salbutamol has, I mean, uh, it, it's come, it's not in our protocol. So uh, if we suspect or if you're not sure about whether it's viral squeeze or bronchiolitis, we usually give a trial of salbutamol and see if they improve or not. If you see that they don't improve, so and we'd observe them for a period of four to six hours. If they do improve, then that would, even if we think it's bronchiolitis, like you said, there might be, uh, you know, although it might edge more towards the side of viral induced wheeze, we could trial salbutamol. But if there's no improvement, then we completely not use salbutamol at all, even if it gives some sort of symptomatic relief and just, mm -hmm. uh, you know, give support to treatment because that is the main sort of treatment for bronchiolitis. Mm -hmm. So, like you said, um, because of the mucus plugs, there isn't much of oxygen exchange. So oxygen saturation goes down. So if you feel like, um, at least in the at least here, according to our guidelines, if it's less than ninety two percent, is when we give oxygen, or we supplement oxygen. Um, and uh, usually, it tends to span from a period of four to ten days, is what they say. And it usually gets worse before it gets better. So it gets worse around the day of four to five, and then it gets better after that. And, and how long can the cough and the wheeze persist for? That could even persist for about two weeks, actually. One actually, minute. a little bit more. It can yeah. persist up to four to six four, weeks. Four to six weeks. So that's something to reassure parents about as well. As in, yeah, they may, you know, the, the child appears better, eating better, feeling better, but still has a cough and you can sometimes hear a wheeze. Parents do get concerned about this. So it is important to address this and say, this can persist for a couple of weeks, up to four, sometimes even six weeks. But if you feel like your child cannot breathe, is turning blue, you know, um, is having difficulty talking as well, 
So that's actually a very important thing because the inability to talk sometimes or while you're gasping for air, inability to complete sentences, they're part of diagnosing asthma severity as well, which is a lack of the fact that you can't breathe. Mm -hmm. Right. So that's an important indication because children won't tell you I can't breathe. Right. So you'd have to they just can't form signs. sentences, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Correct. That's that's very right. Um, anything else that I'm thinking at this moment? Um, Absolutely. There's a special medication that's reserved for certain groups of people. Or is it pa high risk? Pavilumab. Pavilizumab. Is it Pavilizumab? Because I, so I said, I thought it was Pavilizumab as well. And then over here, like one of our consultants did a presentation. Then it was written Pavilizumab or something of that sort. And I was like, <laughs> so I was like, you know, I said, isn't it Pavilizumab? And it's like, no, it's Pavilizumab. And I was like, okay. Uh, Pavilizumab. Yeah. Okay, right. Um, so for these, oh well, no, actually, maybe uh, if are you, you think of um, are you thinking of omalimub, o omalizumab? No, no, I think it's pavilumab. But the, but the reason is, you know, like the like the ending, it signifies what the kind of things. Zumab is a animal uh, derived sort of thing, mm -hmm. and mubab is a human derived thing. So there might be a difference, mm -hmm. but we don't know. I don't know. Maybe. maybe. Okay. Well, most commonly, pa pavilizumab. pavilizumab. Yeah, is used. So the this medication is specifically reserved for those who are those kids who are either born under the under twenty nine weeks. Oh, not or, thirty two is it? Oh. so you're absolutely right. So either born under twenty nine weeks or born under thirty two weeks with a congenital heart disease. Okay. Right, or even existing congenital heart disease is also a risk factor. Okay. If it's not treated, especially you know, it increases risk for severity of in, of infections. Right, so those are things to look out for. But generally, the recommended treatment is supportive treatment. So oxygen plays a huge role. Oxygen sometimes you put on low, you know, low or decreased amounts of oxygen, like sometimes 0.5 liters, just for comfort. You know, it does not necessarily play a therapeutic role per se, but it yeah. helps the child breathe. Right, um, nebulized saline is tried uh, a lot, and it's very important. I I like how you mentioned there's a bronchiolitis type of cough. There's also a barking seal type of cough, which is typically Crew. indicative of croup, exactly, or laryngotracheal bronchitis. Oh, bronchitis, sorry. <laughs> Laryngomalacia, it's an entirely it's something different. Else. Okay. Yeah. So in these kiddos, you would have to, you won't use nebulized saline per se, you'd use dexamethasone, which is a steroid, and you'd use nebulized epinephrine as well. So this is an upper airway disease, whereas bronchiolitis is a yeah. lower airway disease. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Um. Another thing was, uh, we didn't we didn't talk about the work of breathing. So, typically, so so some of the indicators that uh, kind of mandate admission or push admission would be reduced oral intake. So reduced feeding, less than fifty percent, what we say. Uh, increased oxygen requirement. So if the patient is not maintaining oxygen saturation, more than ninety two percent in my case, and um, increased work of breathing. So like tracheal tug, head bobbing. Subcostal recessions and things like retractions. that. Retractions. Uh, sorry, uh, yeah, retraction, subcostal retraction, intercostal recessions, uh, things like that. So those are so those that's increased work of breathing. So like, and you mentioned them even putting 0.5 liters. So sometimes even that little bit of thing can improve these can kind of elevate respiratory distress. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, visibly. Uh, do you guys use something called airvo or no? As yeah, high flow. Air, air vo, that's high flow oxygen. Right. So high flow nasal cannula, that's typically um, given to kiddos who are admitted to the pediatric intensive care unit. Okay. Where you'd put them on, some, you know, six, eight, sometimes even up to 10, 12 liters. Okay. Right. And you'd have something called CNBT, which is con continuous nebulized breathing treatments. Yeah. So like continuous albuterol, essentially. So, and they usually get a dose of magnesium sometimes as well. Uh, which really helps with breathing, and it's even, even in bronchiolitis. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. So these kids, you'd have to definitely make sure you have an eye on their magnesium levels. You don't want them to have, develop hypermagnesemia or toxic magnesium toxicity, essentially. So you definitely have to keep your eye on that, right? Yeah. Yeah, but yeah, kids tend to generally have a very good prognosis with bronchiolitis. Yeah. 
Yep. And what else? I think we just did a crash course on bronchiolitis. We did. We covered almost everything. And uh, for us, just one more thing, because I wanted to add. Um, usually on day four, day five, I, I know I mentioned ninety two percent, but uh, according to a protocol, ninety percent or more is acceptable on day four or day five of bronchiolitis. Mm -hmm. It kind of changes with the day of bronchiolitis that you're at. But most important thing to look at in kids is not necessarily the the labs or the the vitals. They are important, don't get me wrong. But how the kid actually is is, is yeah, clinically. And that's where you gotta have good communication with the parents to know yes. what is the baseline. For example, there may be kids who are very sort of timid, conservative, shy, not too active at baseline. So if they're appearing not active, you can't just immediately assume there's something going on. You'd have to yeah. talk to the parents. Do you feel that there's something different with yeah. your child? And they may yeah. say, no, he, he looks like he's back to himself. Yeah. Some parents sure. may say, no, I feel like there's something horribly wrong. Yeah. Take that into consideration and paint the entire clinical picture. Yeah. Don't ever just treat the labs, treat the patient. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, now that you said that, it's not related to this, but there was another patient who had severe DK um, and then was in ITU, stepped down from ITU. Uh, the lactate when the patient came in was quite high. So it was 4 point something. Came down to 3.7. And then the patient was getting better. VM is normal. But the lactate was like 5.7 on like repeat bloods. And then given the patient was clinically well, I think that's such a different thing in pediatrics where you mm -hmm. always focus on the patient and then the lactate resume. But if you were, if it was an adult, you'd be like, let's push IV fluids or let's hydrate the patient. But the mm -hmm. patient self-resolved, you know, but just because of a uh, lactate of five, we didn't like, uh, you know, panic and do stuff like that. So the consultant was like, let's give it time. This could yeah. be because the patient went through so much stress because of the DK and IT admission, things like that. And it just self-resolved. So it's like, it's quite interesting what you said yeah. that. Absolutely. Yeah. I agree. That's a very nice example. Yeah. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, and hope, hopefully uh, you find what we said, uh, you know, it, it, it's helped you to an extent. It wasn't anything in detail, just the basics. And it's a very relevant topic given we're approaching the season. If you do have any questions, uh, you know, you can message us, DM us at Devikura or um, Dr. Arun or myself. And uh, we have more interesting, exciting topics coming. We have a workshop coming as well. And uh, that's it. I'm going to say, Mummy, Namaskar. Namaskar.